Josh, thanks for joining us. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Why don't we start with your background, where you came from, sort of the arc of your career and where you are now? Yeah, so I got interested in politics uh, in college, really. Um, I had been studying it and, you know, I think everybody sort of like, you know, their political radar perks up when you get into those like post high school years, at least for me. Um, so uh, I started taking a lot of political science classes and uh, Congress really became of interest when I took a class by a professor who spent a lot of his research and a lot of his time in the institution. Um, and I think one of the interesting questions that really came to me was everybody bashes Congress. Uh, everybody thinks it's this like horrible place and it doesn't make sense and it's all stupid and everybody's dumb. Uh, and having had this professor, Ross Baker at Rutgers University, he was like, there's, there's a reason for all of this, right? Like I can explain why everybody thinks it's dumb. Um, there's actually very rational reasons for why the institution is behaving the way it is. And so uh, that piqued my interest. Um, I decided that I wanted to get my PhD in that. So I went to the University of Florida um, and studied uh, congressional reform and uh, legislative procedures uh, for a, a long time there. Uh, I did a year on the Hill as an American Political Science Association fellow in the institution, uh, learning about you know, how members interact with the process, what they think about the process, um, and how it affects their daily lives and how it affects their legislative ambitions. Um, and then I, after that, I landed at the Government Affairs Institute at Georgetown University, uh, which is where I am now, where uh, I educate a lot of people about Congress and its operation, um, particularly executive branch folks who have to interact with the institution a lot. Um, and understand like why they're being authorized and why their funding is late, et cetera. Um, and I continue to research Congress and study the institution and its processes. Uh, your year on the Hill, what, were you at a committee? Were you at a personal office? What, what was your experience there? I was in a personal office with uh, Congressman Keith Ellison from Minnesota Five. He's uh, currently the Attorney General of Minnesota, um, but he gave me a, a fantastic uh, uh, opportunity. Um, when you're on the Hill as a fellow, oftentimes you can kind of be like, turned into a fly on the wall or like a glorified intern, right? And I was like, well, one thing I don't wanna do is to be a glorified intern. Like what I need to do is do like the literal, just immerse yourself in the process. And then at the end of it, like after you've been treading water for a long time with just like, you know, pick your head up and see what you've learned. Um, and he gave me an awesome opportunity to be a staffer basically um, and gave me a portfolio like a normal legislative staffer. So um, I got in the weeds and learned firsthand like what it was like to be a staffer, to have those kinds of opportunities and roles and um, also the struggles and the, and the difficulties of being a staffer and being a member on the house, right? Um, it was a fantastic experience. Great, well, let's talk about your broad research areas. What, what kind of issues are you looking at, uh, you know, broadly speaking and, you know, the, the kinds of major questions you're trying to answer? So in a, in a broad, 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 broad brush, um, I study how institutions affect politics. Um, so uh, basically that understanding is how the rules affect or um, uh, legislative deliberation, uh, how they affect power within the institution. Um, so I spent a lot of time understanding how uh, rules came into existence, um, how they've been implemented and how that implementation has changed over time. Uh, how rule and routines and practices of the house have emerged and gone away. Like while all of a sudden we have norms of one character now and didn't have different norms of a different era and then why they changed um, and how they changed um, and what that did to influence and affect operation and deliberation of the Congress. So broadly speaking, I understand, I try to understand how the rules affect congressional politics um, and how that shapes the decisions that it makes. So it's interesting when we think about this concept of rules you know, there are, there are various types of rules, right? There's, a, there's codified rules that are written down. Mm -hmm. uh, there are sort of, there are some that are of those written rules that may be followed or ignored. You know, there are behavioral kinds of rules that aren't written down. Um, and then there are, I'm assuming, other kinds of outside rules that are trying to be imposed on the people within. So when you define, use the word rule, how do you look at it? Is it the written rules you're talking about of procedure or is it a broader idea? Uh, it's all the above, really. Um, so uh, what I'm trying to understand is both the codified rules. So why an institution is powerful and the like exact authorities that it has. So like, why can the speaker do this today? Right. That's an interesting question. Um, then there's also like kind of like the, the, the folk ways, right? What all these rules uh, incentivize members to do. 
Um, so why do they toe the party line on procedural votes so often? Like, why is there so much partisanship in committee deliberations? Why are message, why are particular amendments? All this can be seen as sort of like an outgrowth of a particular institutional structure. Um, and there are reasons that they're behaving in the ways that they do. They have a lot of incentives uh, to toe the party line, but it's not necessarily written in the rules. It's more like a behavioral norm that formed because of the rules. Um, so a lot of this is really trying to understand how institutions disperse power. And then also what kind of behavioral effects that has on the membership, on the leaders, um, and how bills are processed. Um, because if you change the way the power is structured, you change who is in control of the process, and then you change the incentives, the strategic behavior, and everything about the institution. So um, basically, I'm trying to understand the internal dynamics of Congress from an institutional perspective. Um, there's a lot of electoral factors that come into play, but you know you can still break these things down in terms of the organizational structure of Congress. And so you can have a lot of changes going on on the outside, and then you put all of these new members into an old system, and it turns out that the old system still has a lot of mechanisms that keep churning out the same kind of product. So that's really my interest. It's, it's all of those things. Codified rules play a role in it, but it's also the kind of behavioral routines that emerge because of that. Got it. And so that's kind of broadly speaking what you're interested in. And what specific, I guess, uh, questions are you trying to you know, answer with your research? And have you found any interesting answers? Yeah, so specific questions. Um, my current project looks at the development of House organization and process since 1879. Um, so uh, why did the House transition from a party system to a committee system and then back to a party system again? Uh, what trends are evident in congressional reform? Like why did we empower speakers in 1890? Why did we disempower speakers in 1910? Why do we re-empower them in 1975? The kind of factors that are driving that transition in legislative rules and power. Um, is, is one of the core parts of it. And then what are the factors that cause these changes? Why do we see these changes at these particular times? Um, and the answers that I found are, are kind of not, not surprising and it sounds a little tautological, but uh, Congress's structure is largely because of the institution, right? So that sounds a little weird, but um, it really runs counter to a lot of the thoughts of Congress. I think a lot of people view Congress as a public mirror, for example, like it's just going to automatically uh, assimilate whatever politics are out the, outside the institution and then put them into sort of some kind of like organizational form. So, for example, speakers are powerful today because we have really partisan politics, for example. Um, that would be one kind of manifestation of it. Or we've had uh, less partisan processes in Congress because in previous eras we had less polarized politics and less and, and de partisan, uh, or less, po less partisan politics. Um, and what I'm kind of finding is that institutions have their own path and they have their own distinct um, way of doing things that is often separated from that. So we can have situations where we have really, really partisan politics. Um, but at the same time, we're taking power away from the speaker, right? Or we have a situation where we have a lot of internal disagreement within the majority party, but they're empowering the speaker. Um, similarly, we can have a lot of instances where um, maybe the Republican Party is un like unsure of what it wants to do, right? This is one of the factors that um, is supposed to really empower speakers is to have like a very clear ideological agenda, right? Um, meanwhile, there have been very uh, instances in the recent past where speakers gained a lot of power and a lot of influence, despite the fact that the majority party didn't really have a clear agenda. Like they didn't know what they wanted to do. Um, the Republican Party in 2019, for example, or sorry, 2017, when they had uh, the presidency, the House and the Senate, um, this was a party that has clear internal divisions within it. Um, you have a very, very hardcore, like conservative element to it. And then you've got some more moderate members who came from districts that were more that, that incorporated more Democrats. And after they tried to uh, repeal the ACA and get tax cuts, they kind of didn't have a partisan agenda for the most part. They did a lot of reauthorizations and they did other work. They basically shifted the focus of the institution. Um, but this is a, a majority party that you would typically think is like, that's not very unified, right? You have the Jim Jordans of the world and they clash very, very much with um, the kind of Tom Coles and uh, Paul Ryan's of the world. And then, so there's this really big internal tension um, and normally when you see that, you would think like, wow, you're going to take power away from the speakers, kind of like disable partisanship to a degree within the institution. But what you found is a more powerful institution even then. So um, today, Democrats are experiencing the same kind of sh struggles, right? You have Joe Manchin on one side of the aisle and uh, many of the moderates in the House uh, that, are mo that came from Republican districts. And then you've got the AOCs and many of the other very progressive members. Um, and you would think that this kind of like 
extension, this like broader ideological coalition that Democrats have to uh, bridge would reduce the power that Nancy Pelosi has in negotiating bills and, and policy. In reality, she's probably the most powerful speaker in, in American history, um, bar none at this moment. Um, so what this all gets to is that uh, the institution, the, the congressional evolution is basically a function of its own structure, right? Uh, speakers are powerful because they've been powerful and they just kind of keep accumulating power over time. Um, and they're able to funnel, funnel like every single negotiation through their office, which makes it very, very hard to take power away from them. Um, similarly, um, uh, Congress evolves in ways that are contradictory to the politics outside, right? Um, I just talked about like how the two parties and the majority parties have like significant internal disagreements about the future of the party even, but it's not like manifested in a way that's like taken power away from the party leaders in Congress, the Speaker of the House or the majority leader. If anything, it's also, it's accelerated that. So the institution evolves in ways that's often counter to what we find outside the institution. So um, what I'm basically arguing is that the institution has its own sort of uh, dependence, its, its own sort of path that it creates. And that can often mean that Congress is evolving in a way that's actually contradictory to the changes that we're seeing outside in society. Um, it's not that reflective mirror that many people assume it to be. And it can actually distort the way in which many of these uh, is societal issues are discussed. So um, that's kind of uh, my overall thrust, essentially, um, is that We've got this problem, uh, it's the way that Congress evolves and we're often thinking that it evolves in a certain way and really what we need to be thinking about is how the institutional inertia of the institution actually takes it away from the changes to society and changes to the politics of the parties. In a way, you know, I see your, your view as a little bit optimistic um, or I take it as, you know, as an optimistic, uh, idea that Congress doesn't necessarily have to reflect the polarization of society, right? That you can put a set of rules in place that might, you know, be more, um, if you found the right rules, I should say, the right institutions, that they could function as a, as a kind of a buffer zone and resist a lot of those stretching forces from society to come out with better decisions, um, rather than be a slave to the whims of the population at any even time. Um, I don't know if that, it seems your, your view is a little bit more negative than that, it, you know, it can go counter to the public will, it sounds like. Well, I think one of the things that's really interesting about this is that I think you're right. I think there are rules changes within Congress that can change the way the institution functions um, to enhance it, right? Um, it can change the way that politics is processed. It's sort of like, um, you can think of it as like riding a bike. Right. I think a lot of people assume that like, oh, well, if you just get a new bike rider, the bike will ride differently. So the problem is the people, the members or something along those lines. It's like, OK, well, what you want to do is you want to replace the bike rider and that'll change the way that the bike is ridden. And in reality, like in order to change the way the bike is ridden, you've got to change the bike itself. And I think that there's a significant component to that. Um, where today, I think this process, this speaker driven, majority leader driven process in the House and the Senate, it does an exceptional job of taking all the problems in society and making them partisan. Right? So a lot of the problems that may be bipartisan or could foster bipartisan agreement in some way, shape or form, it kind of processed into this partisanship machine. Um, and it means that a lot of the content and a lot of things that are debated in Congress are funneled through partisan lenses and partisans are the ones that take control of that process. Um, I don't think that's the only way that things could be deliberated. If there was a different process that kind of weakened party leaders, I think you'd see different politics um, because you would have, you would be forced to contend with different ideological forces, um, different members of Congress. Um, and different uh, ways of doing business. In other words, like not everything has to go through the majority leader's office before it reaches the floor of the Senate. Um, I'm sure if you've, you, I'm, I think you've interviewed James Walner already, he would probably say the same thing. Like, why don't you just take power away and let somebody else uh, debate something or bring something up on the Senate floor? Uh, same thing's true in the House, right? Not everything needs to funnel through the Speaker's office to get to the floor. And in fact, in eras where it didn't funnel through the Speaker's office, we saw much more diversity in terms of what comes to the floor and which committees are in charge of bringing bills to the floor um, because they were able to command the legislative agenda in a way that was different than the way that it functions today. So you can change the way and the issues that Congress is focused on. Um, 
by changing the rules and changing the power structure of the institution. Um, it's not going to fix all the problems, right? Uh, there are certainly different problems that emerge when you put a different process on top of the current politics. Um, but there is, I believe, a way to reorient the rules of the house that it restructures the way that it discusses issues and the issues that it focuses on. Yeah, I th I'd like to come back to the, the partisan question a little bit later, but one thing that always uh, strikes me when I think about Congress and the rules is that you know, every two years, Congress could, in theory, just totally change its rules. Every single rule could be thrown out, write a new one if they wanted, and adopt something completely different. Meanwhile, they actually don't make that many changes to the rules Congress by Congress. Uh, since you're a student of this area, why, why don't they make wholesale changes to the rules and only make incremental change? Well, I mean, that's a huge question. <laughs> that's actually a much bigger question than you might assume. Um, one is that members just don't care about rules. <laughs> I mean, they really don't. I think there's an overemphasis on how much the members care about rules. And really, if you were to talk to a member of Congress and be like, what do you think about the House rules? It'd be like the 400th thing on their agenda, right? They're worried about the community center. They're worried about getting money for the bridge in their project. They're worried about like their per committee portfolio and like the few issues that they really care about there. Uh, they worry about like big issues for their constituency and partisan issues that rile up their base that they need to keep on the top. And they worried about other constituencies. Like they do not care about the rules. Right? That's, that's sort of like the secret is it's this background factor that influences everything that happens. Uh, but when you think about it, it makes very little sense for a politician to care about house rules. Um, in fact, the ones that do are pretty unusual. Um, because uh, there's very little incentive or electoral reward for caring about the rules, right? Here is a process or a thing or a group of set of powers and uh, institutions that you can't explain very easily to your constituents. Uh, that is going to give you no electoral reward nine times out of 10 and is going to tick off everybody that you know inside the chamber, and especially the people that have power over your career in the chamber and your legislative influence within the chamber. It's not very rational to be a reformer, to be honest with you. Um, and I think this is one of the reasons that, that the House and the Senate reform itself so very rarely, because it has to get so bad that you have to have members care about something that nobody else in the country cares about, and then constantly raise this issue. Um, and the rules uh, for that very reason uh, become inherent, inherited, right? They're, they're not really like, a, they don't change every two years. Um, this was actually a, a debate that went on in 1890. It wasn't until 1890 that the House considered it decided that it has to readopt rules every two years. Previously, uh, there was a rule in the House rules that said the rules of the previous Congress carry over automatically. Um, so they were literally inherited and that rule was codified in House rules itself. Um, then a guy who wanted to change the entire House named Thomas Brackett Reed, the Speaker of the House at that time came with this new interpretation. He completely revamped the House of Representatives, um, but that process of inheriting previous rules remains, right? And that really hasn't changed very much. Major reform of Congress happens only once every 30 to 40 or 60 years. Um, and the reason for that is because there's very little incentive to do that um, because doing that can mean a lot of negative consequences and it's not particularly electorally viable. So in theory, yes, they could, right? Members could choose their rules every two years, but in reality, what they're doing is they're just taking what they've already got and making some small tweaks to it every two years. Things that really don't change the power of the uh, power in the House or Senate very much, um, and really don't fundamentally shift who has control over the House and Senate agendas. Well, let's talk a little bit about committees because I'm interested in committees in a to a certain extent is because they're they're run by these chairmen who, in, in theory, could put in any rule they want. They're like their own, mm -hmm. you know, free free agent, if you will, when it comes to rulemaking. Um, so, what? How, how do the rules work in committee? And you know, what are the good or bad things, if any, that you've seen in your work as it relates to committee rules of certain rules being better than others or certain committees functioning better than others because of rules? Well, you know, that's a really hard question to answer because the committees have such different rules, right? Um, you know, throughout legislative history, every little committee has become its own legislative fiefdom uh, for these committee chairs in many cases. So, you know, some committees have had like, you know, dozens of subcommittees, for example. Others have had none, 
right? Some have permanent subcommittees. Some have had ones that, uh, you know, just kind of ad hoc, like here's a legislative issue. The committee chair just like, all right, here's the subcommittee that's going to do it. I'm going to appoint the subcommittee chair and they would control the process that way. Uh, today, it's mandated in House rules that each committee has to have a set another set number of subcommittees. But that type of variation that you've seen across House history in terms of the number of subcommittees, for example, is indicative of the type of variation that you find in committee rules. Um, each committee has got its own little its, its own histories, right? It's investigative histories, it's oversight histories, it's legislative histories. Um, so the rules that you find in like the agriculture committee are going to be very different than the rules that you find in the appropriations committee or the rules that you find in the judiciary committee, et cetera, et cetera. Because all of these committees have been animated by very different politics, by very different members, and much different partisanship. It just, you know, their jurisdiction affects the way that these committees function in a big way. So um, on top of that, there are a lot of norms norms that go into this. So outside of like having to conform with house rules, uh, many times the committee chairs just kind of like take power at the beginning of a, of, a, of a hearing. So it's like, you know, they'll start a hearing. Thank you everybody for coming in. This is really fantastic. And we're talking about a very important issue. Uh, by the way, I ask unanimous consent that I can adjourn or recess this meeting at any time until I see fit and such, 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 such. And they set out like a whole bunch of powers, give themselves and cloak themselves with enormous procedural privileges. And then nobody objects to it because if you object to that, then all of a sudden you're in trouble with the committee chair and you don't want to be in trouble with the committee chair if you want to have like a bill you want to pass or a provision you want to get into a bill or et cetera. So on top of the way that, you know, there's committee variation and it's codified rules, there's uh, a lot of uh, norms of behavior that inform how the rules and how committees function. Um, so uh, it's, it's hard to say like and pinpoint like one particular thing that committees do uh, that's unique, uh, but um, there are some norms of behavior. And one of those norms is don't upset the person with the gavel. Um, it's, it's probably the best way to get along to go along and get get what you need out of that particular assignment. Interesting. Um, so what about in terms of the floor uh, over time? Obviously, that's today that's controlled more or less by the speaker. Um, yeah. But can you tell me about what, if, what about the floor rules? What works? What doesn't? Where do you see that? How has that evolved over time? And I guess that that discussion is intertwined with the speaker's control of the rules committee. Yeah, it is. Um, the speaker's control of the rules committee is really the kind of crux of it, right? Um, when speakers have been in control of the rules committee, the floor has been a more restricted space, right? Minority members have fewer opportunities um, to be involved in the process. Deliberation is more structured. Um, conference is more structured. Basically, the, the whole process is more structured when committees have been in, or sorry, when the rules committee has been under the control of the speaker. Um, when it hasn't been, uh, you've seen some more uh, equity equality norms, if you will, right? There's sort of like um, a more open process. Uh, there's more uh, minority debate and inclusion tip typically. Uh, each committee uh, has its own sort of, um, uh, well, what's the best way to put it? Each committee gets a chance to go to the floor and has an opportunity to have their bills debated and amended in a way that's a little bit different today. Party leaders didn't have the same kind of say over the committee agenda and what the committees brought to the floor and when they brought to, where they were brought to the floor because they didn't have the same kind of mechanisms of control. And so what you find in, uh, in times when the speaker has control of the rules committee is just increasing control over floor deliberations. And the speaker comes the sort of like Omnip omnipotent entity uh, that's in all legislative negotiations. Uh, whereas in previous years, there were other people in the room. And it's really that difference that makes it that, that makes a huge uh, difference in terms of how legislation is processed in the House. The difference between the speaker saying like, this is gonna happen and the speaker having to go to several other people and saying like, can this happen, right? Um, and having their input in it. There's a more robust negotiating process when the speaker doesn't have control over the floor rules. Um, one of the things that's really interesting now that the House is doing is they've been under martial law. Like martial law is this situation where you basically waive a lot of the restrictions on when you can do like suspension of the rules, when you can bring up a bill, um, uh, how, how long that bill needs to lay over before it reaches the floor. All that's been waived in the House for the last few months. Uh, and it'll continue until July when I imagine they'll renew this kind of martial law um, again. Um, and this is in July, it will be unprecedented how long the House has been under martial law, uh, under this process where the speaker can sort of waive all of these rules that normally restrict her ability to bring bills to the floor, how long they have to lay over, how much time members have to get to read those le that legislation before it reaches the floor, before it comes to a vote. Um, and the reason that we're seeing this is this is sort of like the latest iter iteration of speaker power. 
right? We're in a, a era of party power. We're in an era of speaker power. Um, and for the last 40 or 50 years, speakers have accumulated more and more and more influence. So now they completely control deliberations. If you have an amendment that you want to bring to the floor, you've got to go to the speaker's office. If you have a bill you want to bring to the floor, you've got to go to the speaker's office. Um, and now she has no restrictions on when she can bring any of this stuff up. Right. So now she has this kind of like informational advantage and asymmetry over everybody else in the chamber. And so all of these things sort of reinforce like a very, very strong speakership. And that's never good for one uh, people of the minority party. Typically, members are really feeling the crunch in the minority party um, and also people with unorthodox positions within her own party. If you are a member with some kind of like unusual ideological stance on whether that's the authorization of the use of military force or criminal justice reform or immigration or anything those lines, there's no avenue for you to reach the floor and force a vote. If you're on one of those committees, you can do that because the process is a little more free flowing in committee, it's a little more open. But unless you're doing that, there's, there's no means for you to affect the process because you've been written out because the process has been structured to produce a particular outcome. Um, and it's done that way because people have the power to do that and they do it. So it does have a lot of impact over how legislation is debated and deliberated and how it comes to fruition at the end of the day. Um, and at, in terms of outcomes, like speakers have uh, unlimited control, but that also means that unlimited control means fewer opportunities for those and for others in the chamber. And what, are there any countervailing uh, trends or, or factors that could push things the other way? I mean, obviously, when Reed did it, there was a counter reaction, uh, you know, at Cannon the same, you know, what about now? Do you see anything that would push in the opposite direction? I mean, there's plenty of angst in the system, right? Um, uh, Justin Amash was uh, somebody who really pushed this particular vision where it's, you know, I don't like having a top-down system, he would say. I don't like having leaders go into a back room and then walk out of the room and say, here's the deal, take it or leave it. Like this is going on the floor. And then members having to eat whatever's been negotiated for them on their behalf. He wanted more inclusion in the process. Now he's gone out of Congress. I don't know what sentiment is left here. Um, there were some reforms within the Republican caucus um, about the steering committee, um, but they were really kind of modest. Uh, they didn't go as far as they needed to if they really wanted a broader scope of voices heard within their own majority. And so what's happened here is like a lot of those countervailing forces have sort of uh, disappeared for lack of a better term. Uh, and you don't see, especially now that Amash is no longer in Congress, you don't see the kind of vocal opposition to that style of um, leadership uh, that you've seen recently. Um, it did have repercussions with Reed and Cannon, but what we are not seeing right now is that sort of like member driven movement to unseat this stuff. Um, and this takes years to develop. When you look under, you know, the Cannon and the Reeds and the David Hendersons of the Czar era, right, of late 1890s, early 1900s, um, opposition to that system really started like in 1896, and it didn't come to fruition until 1910. So this is a long-standing movement that took 14 years to develop. Same thing happened in the House when they were trying to get rid of the committee chairs. The committee chairs are these very powerful institutions back in the 1950s, 60s. Um, Opposition to that system emerged in 1957 with the formation of the Democratic Study, Study Group. That didn't come to fruition until 18 years later in 1975 when they finally empowered speakers to make committee assignments, determine who the chairs were of committees, and then obviously appoint members of the rules. So these things take a long, long, long time to develop. And while there's been some angst and some kind of unrest among majority members, we're not seeing a whole ton of it right now. And certainly not to suggest that there's some sort of uh, uh, underground movement against the speakership at the moment. Um, but we're kind of at that stage in politics, right? Where obviously these, these caucuses are sort of fracturing and sort of displeased with the way the institution is functioning. But we haven't reached that stage where members are willing to risk, uh, take the political risks and dedicate the political resources necessary to change the way that the institution functions in a fundamental way. Mm -hmm. Let, let's move on to the subject then that you mentioned earlier, which is the party side. So one question I have is about this idea of rules uh, imposed by parties uh, on their party members who are also happen to be congressmen or uh, senators. 
what's the form of these rules? Are they written down? Are they not written down? How are they enforced? You know, how are they, who decides what they are? Can you talk about these kind of party rules and how it really plays out? So if you're talking about like the codified caucus rules, they are written down, right? They're, they're no different than the way that the house rules govern business of the overall chamber. In fact, this is the way that the speaker, in fact, now controls the rules committee, essentially. Uh, caucus rules in the Democratic Party and the Republican Party say that the speaker can nominate members to rules, right? That's a separate process. It's no longer in the steering and policy committee for Democrats. It's no longer in the steering committee for Republicans. That is a function of an individual making a choice, right? And, that's the, and then it goes to caucus for ratification. Like if you really didn't like somebody, you could vote down this thing. But again, that has consequences too. Um, but they function a lot like rules and it has a whole lot to do and, and has a big effect on how the parties organize the overall chamber. Now, speakers need to make choices and they have to weigh different political options. But at the end of the day, like when your rules empower you to make appointments to one committee, it was like, well, you have an enormous amount of influence on that one committee. Um, so they function the same way as the house, right? But they have huge implications for the way the house is organized and how it functions. Um, cause different from like Cannon and Henderson and Reed and Carlisle and all those guys from the first party era, if you will, uh, prior to the progressive movement, uh, speakers literally appointed everybody to committee, right? Like I, they, they alone made these choices, uh, today they have to bring in more people. So it's more of a caucus process. Um, but at the same time, those rules affect the way the house functions and the fact that the, the speaker of the house has such influence over who is on the rules committee because of caucus rules means that the whole house functions in a way that the speaker wants it to, which is a fundamental change in the way that things were operating in the house prior to 1975. So the rules of the, of the democratic caucus affect how many seats, how many committee seats you can have, what kind of processes you need to get more assignments, what kind of processes you need to be a ranking member or a committee chair. Um, and they're organizing documents in the same way. Um, there are some caucus rules that are no longer used, for example, like uh, the binding caucus is no longer something uh, used, where if you get two thirds of the members um, to vote on a particular policy, then it binds everybody in the caucus to a particular position and, and policy. That's in the rules, but it's no, it's no longer functionally used. Um, but all of these things have really, really big ramifications for how the institution, the House, functions, despite the fact that they're sort of extra institutional when you consider the House of Representatives because they're sort of documents within each party caucus. So those are actually codified rules <clears throat> the parties come up with. Um, are there non-written rules that they're also following that are, oh, of course. that are norms or that are, you know, unspoken rules about how to behave or act in Congress? Yeah, 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 absolutely. I mean, you know, there's like the, the kind of normal strategic behavior, right? If you want something from the speaker, don't say mean things about the speaker, right? Um, if you want something out of a committee, don't like bash a committee chair. Um, if you want to get something from the party, is a, a great one is you need to toe the party line on procedural votes. Right? You may not be with us on the final product, but you're going to support our ability to bring these bills to the floor and pass them in the way that we want to pass them. Right? That's a norm that, you, that has to happen if you want to get a good committee assignment, if you want to elevate yourself to a committee leadership position, either the subcommittee or full committee level. Uh, there are some things that you just don't do. And all of these sort of norms of behavior and strategic incentives that are given to members are funneled into the parties because the parties have that dominant organizing position and that dominant institutional power. So if you are a member and you want to do well and be successful, like chances are you're going to need to be able to go through the parties and get what you need out of the parties if you want institutional leverage of any kind. Now and it's so, different. That's different right. than going like and say like, oh, I just want to be a celebrity and therefore I'm going to be a social media star. Like you can do that if you're a member. That's a choice. It's an option for you, but it doesn't mean that you're going to have much influence in the chamber. So you're not going to be able to affect policy in the same way.